Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now in unit 4, our poetics unit, and more particularly poetry collection number 5, to uh, Eve Merriam's uh, metaphor on page 722. Before we get there, though, go back to 715 for just a second. Write down, if you would please, at 2B, the ideas of figurative language, and more particularly the simile comparisons using like or as, the metaphor, the comparison that is used without like or as, and of course personification, giving human attributes to something that is an object, an animal, something non-human. Um, our, our challenge now, of course, is to not just say what it is that is a work of figurative, a piece of figurative language, but how it works, right? What is it, again, and how does it work? Write that down in 2B. That's the thing I want you as sophomores to really begin to focus on. When we were freshmen, we spent a lot of time, of course, just learning what a simile, a metaphor, personification, you know, what each one of those um, is or were. Um, but what we're now interested in is asking more particularly, how does it work? How do these figures of speech actually work, especially in developing the necessary imagery and, of course, making messages of 2A? Let's turn to Eve Merriam for just a second on 717, your dates, 1916 to 1992. Merriam developed a fascination with poetry at an early age. She has written poetry for both children and adults. Marion has called poetry the most immediate and richest form of communication. Let's turn now to the poem. It actually is called Metaphor. Okay, So there will be a bit of irony. Let's write this in 2B. There will be a bit of irony even in the title itself. In other words, she is going to say, hey, heads up. I'm going to work with figurative language, more particularly this metaphor, okay, and um, she's going to make some observations about life. Now, this is a very interesting little philosophic poem that is going to already remind us, jot it down at, two, at 3A, going to remind us a lot of Longfellow's Psalm of Life. You'll remember this one. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivy whack of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. We'll come to that. I also want to point out it to be the organization of this poem. So as we get into it, notice it's a very short little poem. But I want you to pay attention to the ways in which the poem is outlined and is organized. All right? All right, let's just listen to the poem for a second, and then we'll come back to work on it. Morning Metaphor by Eve Merriam. Morning is a new sheet of paper for you to write on. Whatever you want to say, all day. Until night folds it up and files it away. The bright words and the dark words are gone. Until dawn and a new day to write on. Now, this is an interesting little poem Come. because it plays around with the idea, go ahead and write it down at level one, that each new day for us is what... Well, you would, of course, qualify it as an opportunity. That's what we would write at level 2A. We would say each new day is an opportunity. But notice at level 1 what she says is morning is a new sheet of paper for you to write on. Now, let's think about the way in which a metaphor like that works. Again, in what ways is a day, a morning, a new sheet of paper for you to write on? How does that even work at all? Well, let's list, obviously, issues of potentiality. The day is, of course, blank paper, and now you have the opportunity to write whatever you want to write on to that uh, sheet of paper, right? That idea that you get to choose. Let's put this in our notes at level one. This is another one. Really important. You get to decide what you will do with the day that you have. Of course, in the end, then in the evening, notice the personification of night. We'll fold up the sheet of paper, file it away. We can almost think about the source of our dreaming happens through the experiences of our day. And bright words and dark words are gone until dawn, and a new day to write on. That is to say, the cyclical nature of our life as well. Every morning, we have a new opportunity. Every day, we have the potentiality to write something important. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. 
What are the major messages of a little poem like this? Well, I would say there's at least three. One of them has to do with this issue of potentiality. You can always potentially make every day a remarkable day. Something important can happen if you wish for it to. I think that's the second major message here. It's the issue of freedom. You're as free as you allow yourself to be. You're as creative as you allow yourself to be. You, all of us, are artists. All of us are writers of the day's events. We get to decide. No, I do not. I come to school, I got to go to the same classes every day. I got no, absolutely no freedom. No, that is not true. You are free to use those opportunities each class period. I mean, you go back to a lecture that we gave, for example, when we were studying Rachel Carson's science nonfiction essay about the power of the shoreline. Remember what we said about you have the decision to make when you step across the threshold of a science classroom whether you're going to take this experience and try and grow and learn from it or for you is it just one more thing you got to do that's painfully boring and the like, right? If you'll think about it, a whole lot of the texts we've been studying point to a little poem like this about human freedom. Your ability to be able to decide what you want to do with your life. And, of course, we can think about a text like uh, uh, Retke's uh, Waking, right? That notion that you wake up to the fact that your life is your life. Let's finish number three of three, at 2A. Another major message here is every action has a consequence, a ripple effect, we might say. And because that's the case, we should seek to be as intentional as we can be in our making our decisions. You'll remember that when we were studying Retke's poem, Waking, we, we quoted those lines from Thoreau's Walden, that notion of a conscious endeavor to try to decide how you will, in fact, be intentional throughout your day. And it matters, not just to you, but of course to the world that you live in and the others around you. Let's think about at 2B how this poem works and the irony of the title metaphor, right? For example, she could have called this poem morning or new day or something like that. Instead, she calls it metaphor, telling you that she wants you to recognize she's playing a game, a language game with you of a kind, right? That is to say, hey, have you thought about the fact that your life is kind of, in itself, a metaphor. Your life is blank. Right? Think about this. Your life is blank. Now you get to decide what that blank is that you'll fill it in. For her, she'll say, it's like a sheet of paper that you write on. They may not work for you, so you maybe need another metaphor. Watch this, if you're a gamer. Your life is a game. Now, that's a fascinating way to think about it. If you take gaming seriously, the way I know several of you do, when we use the word game, we don't mean insignificant, we mean competition, as in game. Does that make sense, what we just said? We're, we just did that poem, Glory, right, about competition of sport. Your life is blank. We're just going to come to this here in a moment in 3B. Let's just point out the irony of the use of the word metaphor. In other words, what Miriam is suggesting is, I'm going to call each morning a new sheet of paper that you can write on, but you get to decide what for you is the best working metaphor to talk about your life. I mean, technically, all you're doing the whole time I'm sitting here talking to you is breathing. That's called your life. And then at some point, you're not going to breathe anymore, and that's going to be your death. But notice our stories. We are the stories we tell, we retell, the stories we accept, the stories we reject. Our stories keep reminding us that there's something valuable in your breathing. But it's only valuable, Marianne points out, if you make it that way, if you decide, you have the choice to decide. Now at 3A, I already forecasted that we would be talking about Longfellow's Psalm of Life, Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not that what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust return us, was not spoken of the soul. What is for you the text that teaches you this idea? What is for you the psalm that reminds you 
that your life has meaning and you get to decide what you do with that life of meaning. What is that song? I've had students that sometimes say, yeah, dude, I don't listen to any songs that say that. You might want to think about the music that you're listening to then. If the music that you're listening to constantly is telling you that your life is of no value and there's no point in this thing called your existence, you may want to think about choosing some other music to go along with or to counterbalance a position like that. No question there's pain and suffering. That's part of the verses that you will write down. But there is, of course, this notion of the cyclical nature of your day and therefore your life. Everything is about rhythms, and to that degree, it makes sense to ask about what you're doing with those rhythms. Finally, let's go to it at 3B. Write these words, life, or maybe more particularly, my life is. And then draw a blank. What is the metaphor that best works for you? Here it's a sheet of paper that you get to write on. For some students that works. For other students who don't enjoy writing, for example, it doesn't work at all. But for example, if they're gamers, when they write, my life is a game, all of a sudden they have a different sense of what that metaphor means for them. What is the metaphor for you? My life, for the musicians in the house, my life is a song, my life is a tune, for those of us who, for example, enjoy uh, um, vehicles, my life is a fill in the vehicle that for you, you most represent your life as. That is to say, all of the beautiful mechanics of a well-oiled engine. What is it for you? What is the metaphor that reminds you that your life has some kind of meaning? And now a final question. What are you doing with that sheet of paper? To what degree are you intentional in the use of your days? Or are you rather inclined to say, i got to be honest, up to this point in my life, I don't actually live my life, it seems more to live me. And I'm just kind of here as like a, a, a halfway participant in the project. You'll maybe remember um, in a freshman lecture, and then again in your junior year, we'll talk about Walt Whitman. Whitman had a strong argument to make that the powerful play goes on, he says, and you may contribute a verse. That is to say, there is always something that can be done to leave this world a better place, a more awakened place, a more intentional place, a more compassionate place than you found it. The real question is, what are you doing? What did you do yesterday? Put this at 3A, when we are seniors, I'm going to come back to this, this is why I'm reminding you of it now. Um, we're going to study Wordsworth's classic, Ten Turn Abbey. He will talk about what it is that makes greatness, and he calls it this, little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. What are those acts of kindness and love that you did yesterday, or that were done for you? Miriam's metaphor, just to challenge you a little bit. And notice the brilliance of a little tiny short poem, but the power of that poem.